Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd just like to open with saying uh, thank you to uh, Capital Ship Management and to Green for Sea Awards uh, last night for um, arrange, oh, awarding us the uh, initiative of the year. Um, that was, uh, I know my members were absolutely delighted and it was also fantastic to see another one of our members, uh, Anami um, Technologies, being involved in the Dry Bulker uh, Award as well. But I'm going to start maybe with a little, little bit of a different perspective. Um, Paris Agreement, 1.5 degree target um, of global warming, um, reiterated by the IPCC report uh, late last year, of which I was one of the expert reviewers. I'm very worried about using expert now because we had that slide saying uh, an expert in the past. Well, my best years are behind me, I, I expect. But anyhow, this is a serious challenge for shipping. Um, and if any of you were here last year, I actually did a short presentation uh, last year, and this was the headline um, issue that I put up there. Now, we are very far away from this. We are very far away from having ships that will be operating uh, effectively in a net zero emissions world. That means every single ton of CO2 that we burn um, or that we release will need to be compensated for. So it's a very serious challenge. Um, but in the last 12 months, we've seen a, a massive change. Um, 18 months ago, everybody that I knew at IMO in the shipping world says, there is no way on earth we will ever put a numerical target on shipping emissions in the shipping world. Now we have one. That is a dramatic change. And we are the only industry worldwide to actually set a worldwide target. I'd like to point to the underlying part, at least 50%. So this can well be ratcheted up in the future. Anyhow, um, Global Stocks Directive, um, looking like that will increase prices. Um, the carbon price, now the EU ETS itself alone has seen a dramatic rise in carbon price from seven to uh, $20 a ton. So this is changing the backdrop, the, the, the situation. And finally, Maersk joined, joined that uh, uh, pressure or increased that pressure by announcing their global fleet will be carbon neutral by 2050. Massive gauntlet laid on the table for all of their competitors as well. How are they going to do it? Well, I'll show you one of the pathways using wind propulsion. And I'm the Secretary General of the International Windship Association. Um, we have over 100 members. These are corporates, uh, research institutes, etc. And we are actually establishing a number of uh, hubs or centers of excellence. One is already established in France for the Atlantic coast of Europe. Another one is uh, underway in uh, North Sea and Baltic, probably based around Hamburg. Hopefully, we'll have one in the south uh, around the Mediterranean. We're also developing them in America, South Pacific, and Asia. Um, what, can we, what can the wind deliver? This is the major question that a lot of people ask me. And today, I'm going to quickly uh, skip through what, what it can do, what areas it can deliver on, what areas can it also help facilitate. And this um, headline figure was taken from an EU report in 2017, which was referred to last night. And you know, we like to go at the top end and say, oh, 10,700 installations. But please remember, this prediction or this forecast, any forecast is going to be wrong, but this forecast was made before the sulfur cap was agreed and way before the IMO initial strategy was uh, put out there. Um, so what does wind propulsion actually uh, do? Well, it's a primary, primary renewable. That means we don't need to use wind to convert into electricity to then be used through all the processes that we've seen today and a huge amount of energy loss. It's delivered directly to the vessel, free at the source of use. Um, 
interesting, a lot of people say, ah, but the ROIs don't work, you know, return on investment, ah, it's going to be tough. Well, for example, in the aviation industry, we have Rolls-Royce leases its engines to aircraft. I only found that out at 36,000 feet one day, uh, next to an aeronautical engineer who said, yeah, they, they upgrade the software as well when you're, when you're flying which is a little bit scary. But anyhow, um, we're developing leasing and rental modes. Um, one of the projects at the moment that's just sea trialing, which I'll show you in a moment, um, is actually has a modular containerized system. So you can put it on a windy route. When you're coming back and it's a less windy route, you take it off. Um, it also helps to facilitate secondary renewables. We've heard a lot about the costs and the difficulty of uh, bringing in secondary renewable options, hydrogen, ammonia, etc. Well, if you're bunkering, say, 20%, 30% less, that becomes a much easier pie to actually uh, uh, consume. So that facilitation, if you're looking at a wind hybrid, and still people in the industry say to me, oh, Gavin, you're, you're the guy that's saying we shouldn't have any engines. No. All of these systems, of course, are hybrid systems. Um, and we, we had the word crystal ball earlier on. Um, I don't have one. However, neither does anybody else in the industry. And what wind does, even though it may be a little bit more expensive at the beginning, you basically create a predictable fuel future, say for 20 or 30% of your expenditure. You know it's going to be zero tomorrow. You know it's going to be zero at the end of that ship's life. You can start planning around that. You can start investing around that. Now, getting onto the actual technology toolbox, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there are basically seven major areas, and I'll actually get to examples and explain what each of those are. Um, stage of development, as you can see, just very quickly, a highlight, 2018, 2020, we're seeing a lot of the systems coming out of sea trials now and coming into commercial installation. Already we see quite a few in my next slide. I'll show you the Fletner rotor uh, developments. Now, rotor development, actually I had to change this slide for this presentation. I think this is probably the last year I can use this slide because things are really accelerating now. We now, ha uh, so a Fletner rotor works on the principle. It's a rotating cylinder with a small electric motor. A lot of people see it spinning. They think it's generating electricity. It's not. It spins, the wind catches it, and through the Magnus effect, which is similar to a spin ball, if you throw a spin ball in baseball, it whips around. That is called the Magnus effect, and that creates thrust. It also creates a little bit of lift. Um, now, these, this is actually a 100-year-old technology. The first ships that were fitted with this were in the 1920s. Economics kind of killed that off um, in, 90, in, the, in the crash that we saw around the 20s. But it's been re-engineered, rethought of. And last night we saw um, the uh, Anamoy, uh, sorry, Anami, um, MV Avros Bolka, which is a 64,000 ton Bolka with four movable rotors because she's a geared vessel, so we can get those out of the way for loading and unloading. Um, we've had the Maersk uh, L2 or LR2 um, Maersk Pelican tanker, which is a 109,000 ton uh, tanker. She's been fitted with two 30 meter rotors and she was uh, uh, out at sea within a couple of days of having those retrofitted um, in August. Also, Viking lines are moving, and we've also had testing with the Echo Fletner. We now have six vessels operating 14 rotors commercially with years of data coming in now. So, you know, this is starting to break open into the market, and I'm very excited about this year and 2020 to see the, the sales numbers. So, at that point, that's gone mainstream, so I don't need to talk about it anymore. Um, moving on, we've got two other um, major, well, one other major area that's developing quite quickly at the moment, and there's so much information here, I just thought I'd go with pictures. So the, the one on the, okay, the top left is actually a, a carbon neutral design 
where they're looking at a 30%, uh, so this is a new build, um, a 30% uh, reduction in um, uh, fuel use through the wind, plus um, you know, a redesign of the hull, optimization of the other systems. So it's an interesting concept. There's going to be some big announcements over the next couple of months in this project. So unfortunately, that's, I was hoping it was going to be unembargoed today. Um, it still is embargoed. The, the vessel in the middle is a beautiful French design vessel by Chantier Atlantique, which used to be uh, STX Europe. And this is actually a, a series of uh, expedition cruise vessels that uh, go up to 190 meters long, 70% primary wind propulsion. And they're testing the rigs at the moment on a Ponant uh, uh, vessel. And I actually talked to the designers of this, of this and I said, couldn't you have got that up to 90%? And they said, ah, but she looks nice. So actually, there is room for more optimization. And I think that's a very French attitude here. She looks beautiful, so we'll, 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 we'll go with the design as it is. Um, well, I've only got 30 seconds here, so I'm going to quickly go through. Um, the one on the bottom right is quite interesting. That's actually a 300,000 ton VLCC uh, by the Chinese um, connected with Costco. They've just been testing this. Um, we also have MOL have just finished their land testing, and they're going in 2022. They'll be um, fitting a, a full-size rig there. Um, on the bottom right, oh, sorry, bottom left is uh, Valianus, Valianus Marine and Becker, Becker Marine Systems are developing a car carrier. They're hoping to have that launched in 2021 slash 2022. So a lot of developments there. Um, moving on very quickly in my I'm going to go over by about 30 seconds here. Um, there are some soft, soft sail developments here. As you'll see from uh, some of the logos here, we have Airbus, we have Renault Group, all coming on board here as cargo partners for these projects. That's a massive change. Uh, the Airbus guys are with Air, Air Seas, which is a kite development. And the interesting one, which I mentioned before, is the uh, uh, middle left is a thing called a Ventafor, which was actually invented by Jacques Cousteau um, back in the 80s. And it's a suction wing. It actually sucks wind in to the, to the wing itself. And this is a containerized system which you can rent or lease onto your vessels. Um, just gone for sea trials. Thank you very much. I'm time up. Thank you very much.